questions I wanted to pose. Um, I, I do want to give Gashba a chance to respond to, to what you've all said. Um, so, so one of the other, or part of the other question will be whether there uh, are certain features of the current situation that the concept of post-fascism doesn't sufficiently grasp and whether we need to supplement it with other things, as, as I think Michal was suggesting. But maybe uh, in addition to that, or in future comment, you could also think about what Kulmagash has just said and what uh, Yaroslav was, was also pointing to in a, in a different way. Yaroslav said uh, how, pointing pointed to the problem of neoliberalism, which Gashba, you also mentioned, uh, and, but in particular how the extreme right, the new right, is presenting itself as the, the fighter against neoliberalism. We have this situation in which I think, I, mean, I think many of us who consider themselves to be on the left were waiting for the moment in which finally neoliberal hegemony would start to, to fall away and we saw maybe some cracks forming in it and we, we thought that we'd been organizing for all these years and, and spreading a little bit of left discourse and maybe this would be the moment for the left to take over and I think maybe we didn't uh, pay enough attention to what was happening in other parts of society um, or for possibly other reasons, but uh, we aren't the ones with the initiative at this moment. And uh, the critique of neoliberalism would seem to have been taken up in, in large part by the extreme right, uh, or at least in the rhetorical, uh, on the rhetorical level. And, and at the same time, then we see nominally leftist parties which, which take up various aspects of this, this discourse of critiquing neoliberalism along with advocating further exclusion and the left would seem to be shifting away or this, as this part of the left shifts away from this uh, traditional position that's always been maybe somewhat uh, less than completely secure but the traditional position of being the champion of the marginalized to the position of advocating exclusion in one form or another. Uh, so, so yeah, I think we'll start again with, with Kashpar. <clears throat> no, but I don't want to go into 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 detail of Jean Bataille or anything. I also, let's not forget that this is 16 years old writing, and I have thought a little since about these matters. Uh, one thing, one thing I should uh, emphasize uh, that Ernest Franco's classical view of uh, a normal legal government and prerogative government is a, still a valid description of Hitler's system in which, say, you know, thieves were still uh, punished, in, you know, wills were executed, marriages were completed, etc., etc. The normal state went on, while the totalitarian uh, extremist state uh, functioned in a parallel fashion. That was unique to historical fascism and doesn't need to be occupied by us, but it's not identical with what Bataille has said and also his term of homogeneous society and heterogeneous society, they are not two parts of society. But anyway, that's a question of history of ideas, I won't do this. What I consider <coughs> to be essential here, and I agree, you all intimated this to a certain extent, and I do agree with you, but also my original essay too, it has been developed since, uh, has said it, I, and don't forget that it was published in 2000, when these extreme right parties were not so much in the march. So what I considered to be post fascism was a whole transformation of capitalist society in that, in that respect. And neoliberalism was an aspect of this. And uh, because of course it has allowed this kind of uh, 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 discrimination and exclusion to function. And of course it elicited these atti fantastic attitudes that would scandalize people in 19, in, in 1819, you know, when the first poor laws were voted by the British Parliament, when it was the first time that these attitudes that the non deserving poor should be punished in the workhouses instead of being held, well, that's, you know, that's really a regress. And in many, and let's, you know, it's not fashionable to say, but in many, many uh, regards, we are in regress. But let me just uh, 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 trying to, to get rid of the uh, 
how do you call it, the Wortlaut, the, the real text of that essay, that's, you know, that's gone. But what I, what I want to emphasize, and which I simply forgot to say in my introductory remarks, and which I think is extremely important, I simply forgot this, no, 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 no philosophical reasons. What happens is a very interesting thing, that class as such is again recognized, as it wasn't under neoliberalism, when both the pro-neoliberals neoliberals and anti-neoliberals were concentrating on race and gender inequality and such. And, you know, in, in global terms too. But how is class rediscovered by the right? It's a very interesting, very interesting thing. In the following manner, class is considered to be something that is within whiteness. So, within, among whites, among the white established classes, as it were, there is a class problem. There is a clear class problem. The white working class, so much talked about nowadays, but also the white middle class, or, you know, um, what is called in my own dear country, the Christian middle strata, or whatever. You know what Christian means, you know? It means non-Jewish. Uh, and you know what Magyar means? It means non-Gypsy. Okay, that's a negative terms. But, you know, but, but all these synonyms, you know, mean that class has appeared again. There is a kind of inequality. That the present day establishment is not uh, uh, satisfied with that, you know, people should be held within the purview of whiteness, i.e., for example, in the most concrete way, uh, as Joe has written in his excellent article in the Le Monde Diplomatique I read today, austerity for them, welfare for us. So it is not true any longer there's austerity for everybody, that was the original form for neoliberalism, i.e., for everybody except the richest families. But, but yes, welfare state for us and state and inclusion for them. These them and us are differently defined in various societies. Of course, there's not, not a clear system. But it is quite an extraordinary, although not wholly unprecedented thing, that classes with whiteness. You see, it has a precedent in the very immoral politics of the social democratic movement that has been in favor of colonialism and colonial conquest and imperialism while fighting for equality in the metropolis, obviously. So, you know, it has a past. It has a very distributed <coughs> past that encompasses also the black uh, uh, chapters in the history of the left, obviously. And, you know, Zeman is not the first. First were the Scheidemanns and the Noskes and the Friedrich Eberts, weren't they? And um, etc. etc. And, uh, <clears throat> and, you know, uh, to name only Germans. <laughs> we could name others. Plehardovs. Yeah. And uh, even there was some understanding for the civilizing world of British imperialism in India in the works of Marx. The moment when this has been really understood that this is wrong, that is 1914, when there were a few people called, you may not like those names, Lenin and Trotsky and Rosa Luxemburg understood that this won't do. And it was the Russian Revolution, October 1917, the first and until now the only and its sequence internationalist revolution in world history. And that went against against uh, national conquest, annexation of territories, oppression of national and ethnic minorities, against colonialism, against secret diplomacy, against permanent armies, etc. etc. against the whole machinery of war against nations, weaker nations. Now, okay, but that seems to be the distant past, doesn't it? So now what we have is a class discourse, surprisingly for us, 
a class discourse coming from the right, you know, and, but of course which is very much combined with race. <coughs> but not in the old way, not in the old way, and in the new innovative way. But not totally innovative, it's, you know, if I'm not very much mistaken, it was part of this called the Na Nationalsozialistische Deutsche Arbeiterspartei. Uh, okay, and so on and so forth. And socialist, <coughs> national socialist. Oh. But this is not what I'm saying, that class within whiteness is just simply a ruse, a manipulation. This is how it has been seen by the establishment for a long time. That's true, so I agree with you. This is how, you know, it's even reformers who would say, okay, yes, of course, let's have higher pensions, better hospitals, better schools, but all our better schools and better hospitals and so on are, you know, fuck, um, uh, <laughs> okay, fucked up by, uh, by immigrants and by the colored and all those people who will pee on the corridors, you know, or we know where you are, where they are, and we want just to fight for the welfare of our honest, hard-working people, and here there are these parasites coming. <coughs> but this, of course, can mobilize, well, this, this is not you, it can mobilize the white working class, the white middle class, and from this kind of conception, almost everybody in the establishment is contaminated. So this is why I agree with you. That's, that's not just, you know, Boris Johnson and Trump, of course not. And what about, what about the colonial wars and what about the colonials? And you know very well how, you know, the white great powers have treated the colored people in the last 600 years. And uh, there's nothing new in that. What is new is that this is coming as a refreshing new wind, as a great truth for many people. Because even this seems to be slightly less hypocritical than what went on before. So it's politically very, very clever in a way, simple but clever. But you, at least you, should be on your guard. Because this is not the authentic tool of class, of course. And so this is what I wanted to add. Thanks. If I'm not mistaken, I think, I think in order to follow up, uh, the, in, the, in the original article he wrote on post-fascism, in fact, the idea is much more about a tendency within the establishment than about the rise of the street. Right? So now, we're the, faced with this, this complication that we have yes. two extremisms in some sense. Uh, but uh, now I think we can, we can see, open it up to whoever feels the most urgent need to respond. <laughs> so, if, um, well, I must agree uh, on, on you, and uh, I, I thank uh, for a cute point uh, because the theme of class is uh, the, is. Uh, uh, the, uh, the issue which disappeared for many years and uh, uh, today we can see the, uh, ref uh, the refreshment of the concept and uh, uh, I would say that, uh, uh, that um, uh, the liberal left, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, mean the uh, Democratic Party, the United States, and uh, uh, other uh, similar parties in uh, Europe, uh, they, uh, they had uh, politics of multiculturalism, and uh, uh, this politics can be considered to be some kind of internationalism. Because we uh, want to uh, to open uh, the opportunities to other uh, minorities and without uh, 
uh, respect to their origin and to their uh, uh, their uh, uh, positions in in group and. Uh, uh, what was suppressed was just uh, the concept of class. The class uh, uh, became invisible in the politics of multiculturalism. And uh, I uh, would say that uh, Donald, Donald Trump uh, uh, class politics is uh, a kind of uh, of uh, the return of uh, the suppressed uh, what was suppressed before but in the uh, shape uh, which uh, can be seen as a, a perverted one I know but uh, 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 despite uh, the fact, I uh, mean that uh, there is a lesson of Donald Trump. Did you understand? Well, sorry about that, just for precision's sake. Multiculturalism has nothing to do with internationalism. I'm sorry, but you know, first of all, internationalism entails the end of the nation state. And multiculturalism doesn't mean anything of the sort. And <clears throat> internationalism means you know, the uh, destruction of those structures that would uh, be able to exercise national exclusion and uh, uh, national inequality. And multiculturalism, on the contrary, would just accept the parallel existence and isolated existence of all cultures. This is the basis for identity culture that is one of the culprits of this new uh, uh, development which is not so much racist as culturalist, if you wish to call it a bad term. Uh, uh, and so, I mean, that, that's... But uh, that's just the second issue. I just wanted to be precise about this. That, that's basically all. And uh, also that class is suppressed. Well, the, rest, the left, to the extent that exists, never has linked to class. The Democratic Party of the United States of America is not a left party. It's never been one, it still isn't, and it will never be. Uh, base uh, Bernie Sanders put yeah. Bernie Sanders. Yes. Actually, I, I want to keep with this idea of internationalism for a moment, uh, and maybe this can take us back to the problem of the left. Is, is there a way of bringing a new internationalism back today, or, or would any of you like to speak on what the left can be in response to post-fascism within and outside the establishment? Yeah. Yes, uh, I would add uh, one remark to your definition of, of, uh, of class and how the extreme right Talking about class, I think uh, extreme right today is very clever. It's uh, because uh, it uh, uses different strategies. On the one hand, it uses the, let's say uh, left-wing arguments and social arguments against liberals, against liberal right. And on the other hand, it uses sometimes neoliberal arguments against the left. So it's kind of a, the poor. the poor. So it's kind of a double face, and it, it works pretty well because it's kind of a opportunistic argumentation, uh, but, uh, but but it works, of course. And uh, the question also is uh, welfare for the white working class. Okay, but which kind of welfare? Uh, it's very minimalistic welfare uh, in our post-communist so post countries. Is uh, we have flat taxation, we have almost no welfare state, and so on. So, so, so this welfare is very, very, very little. I mean, and it's it, just talk. It's talk, yes. So, on the level of, of talk, they are very clever. They also, uh, they also, uh, they, they also, um, let's say, they, they uh, are not afraid of political manipulation, and they are very sharp. 
they, they are very, very clever uh, when they, they polarize the political scene. I mean, uh, we, the left-wingers, are uh, so shy in comparison with them. They, they are not afraid to polarize, really, and they are not afraid to manipulate. They, they don't have the notion of uh, kind of a truth. Uh, if they have conspiracy theory, uh, they, 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 they use it uh, very, very quickly, and they spread it. So I think the far right, uh, so, so in a way politically, the far right should be kind of an inspiration in some way for us, at least for the polarization. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think so. And uh, the second, second, uh, second uh, way, uh, uh, the, the second uh, thing. I like the term post-fascism because uh, it, uh, in my opinion, really captures the current situation. But on the other hand, from the political point of view, it's a kind of a defensive, defensive concept. Because uh, I think it brings the notion that, okay, we uh, are living in um, kind of a exclusionary post-fascist uh, times. Uh, we are uh, uh, under threat. We are under threat. That's the, that's the notion. And uh, when we are under threat, it brings defense, defensive, uh, defensive posture. And uh, one of the consequences of this defensive posture is that the radical and liberal left is being pushed together with right-wing liberals. Because in a way, I think we are afraid of new, something new, whatever it is. So we are pushed with right-wing liberals. But the sad reality, especially of the post-humanist world, and for example of the Czech Republic, is that the majority of people don't like these right-wing liberals because of the post-communist transformation, because of the consequences of so-called um, privatization and culture privatizations and uh, neoliberalism in Central Eastern Europe and so on. So the, the sad consequence is that a lot of us, sadly, in a way, are defending remnants of liberal democratic institutions, but, okay, it has logic, and uh, we, we all know why is that happening? Okay, but the sad consequence is that from the standpoint of the of the impoverished and uh, and, and uh, majority of the people who don't like uh, the consequences of, of uh, the so-called post-communist transformation, uh, we are uh, viewed more or less the same as right-wing liberals, as the, the defendants of, of the old order which, in, in, in people's opinion, should disappear in some way. So I think there is also a lack of imagination, of political imagination and utopian imagination, of imagination uh, of a uh, new future. Uh, I think that's this advantage. And in a way, the question, what should the left, uh, uh, what, what, what uh, should the left do in such a situation is uh, maybe useless in, in uh, this situation uh, here and now. We should discuss it, let's say, in a, in a political gathering, in a gathering where we, uh, where we uh, should uh, maybe establish a new movement, new party, whatever, but uh, it's not, it's not uh, <coughs> very, I mean, it's in a way useless to, to discuss about it. I think uh, it's uh, necessary to act as well. And uh, that's, the, that's the point. So, so uh, I wanted to say that this concept of post fascism analytically, okay, it also brings kind of a notion of uh, state of exception, that something unusual is happening, that we are under danger, but it also can be, uh, it also can bring fear and uh, sense, of, <coughs> a sense of defensive posture with which we should uh, overcome. Yeah. I don't know word. Yes. Uh, uh, two days ago, when my book was presented, I was called a utopian, and I'm called a defense. <laughs> Is that okay, okay, well, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, 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 so on a more optimistic note, then, uh, let me say that you said, how clever, you see, right, or, you know, 
more covered and overt human rights were because of the manipulation, the force of the manipulation of the distortion. Well, this is our greatest chance. We should look at them. If they want to be successful, they have to lie. We don't. We don't. Uh, it's, uh, it's always possible to lie, but you know, in order to be forced to lie, in order to be identical with distortion, in order to present the problem of society such as injustice, such as inequality, such as suffering, such as deprivation, such as unhappiness, such as the total devastation of sensuality and of direct access to pleasure and to time and to nature and the enjoyment of our own practices, not only artistic, our own human practices. Yeah. If you talk seriously about these problems, you don't have to lie. And if indeed you use the language of liberation, that has been, of course, abused, what has not? Everything has been abused. Still, there's a chance that the language of liberation can be used in accordance to, or if not to ultimate truth, at least to a responsible and critical investigation of society. That test would not be with truth why this uh, manipulative, uh, seeing right discourse for a minute. And so, you know, less than this pessimistic. So I think that I still would believe that uh, with a minimum of Machiavellianism uh, that would be possible. But what I would propose, taking your question very seriously, because it's a serious question, quite apart from this, but, but, uh, uh, but, I think that if you ask me, so what the left could do? Yes, to show the depth of bitterness and of deprivation, because that's the truth. If it sounds bitter, and if it sounds, you know, fear-making and intimidating, yes, such is tragedy. Tragedy is tragic. You can't go around that. You know what I mean? But if you need to say that your aim is somehow to go through this dark continent, and I don't mean every European continent, and to try to re-establish uh, freedom and happiness, well, I don't think that nobody, nobody will stop and say, let's try. I mean, you know, we, we, we can't, you know, we can't offer a real competition to these people in meanness. I, mean, you know, I don't think, and this is why I'm here with you, because you wouldn't. And I don't, I don't want to, and I don't want you either, to offer the battle in these terms, which you are anyway bound to lose. Because you see, that's an old, old thing. You know, it, the communists tried in the 1920s and 30s. The social democrats have been trying. But everybody knew that the fascists are better fascists than the communists. <laughs> if somebody wants fascism, he'll want the original product. <laughs> Do you have an answer to my distortion of the comments you posed in the, in the original comments, in the initial comments? Um, is there something more that we that the left should do, or is there another challenge that you think that should be posed? Um, and to convince, other than to, to take the path of supporting the left as it is. I have some comments, but I think that the left should open the floor for yes. the possible questions. And so I would cut myself in here in favor of others because I think they are more interested in quite right. responses of others. Thank you very much, then. And let's uh, open up the floor for we have time for a couple of questions. I think.
So my, my uh, tell me, well, it's very basic. But why now? Why is this happening now? What is the uh, seduction, or um, you know, what has gone wrong with the neoliberal plan as such to provide fertile ground for this, um, you know, blossom of foul. I mean, because it's it's always been I can speak this very always been right. It's been kept under wraps. And now it's out of the box. And so, I, I, for me, it would be helpful to uh, how to respond in order to understand what I'm responding to on the larger historical point, as opposed to just like, oh, these guys are assholes. <laughs> oh, and maybe we could, yeah, we can collect two or three questions now. Are there any others? Questions, objections, comments. <laughs> Um, I just have a short uh, question. The, let's say historical fascism is a tradition based on a strong leadership uh, or on charismatic leadership, right? Uh, but it kind of usually cannot or isn't able to reproduce itself after the death of the leader, right? At least in terms of uh, governing ideology or uh, as, a, as a system. So, uh, how do you see the prospects of, uh, let's say, today's post-fascism in, in, in these times? Thank you. Yes, both of you. Yeah. My question is, I guess, about uh, Roberto Eco. He formulated the concept of ur-fascism. Yeah. And I was wondering uh, where you might differentiate, if you're familiar with it, where it differentiates entirely. It was kind of on a continuum of this uh, and more psychological concept for where fascism is going and draws this conclusion between historical fascism and post-fascism. Where do you find the differentiation between your concept of post-fascism and real fascism? And my question would be, uh, how do you address the, the fear of the masses, which, which feel that even their, their uh, small um, wealth or welfare is being taken away, if you only talk down to them saying, okay, you're still better off than all those Nazis invading Europe, they're not going to feel any support or answer to, to their fears. How do you talk to them? I think some of those words specifically meant yes, we're going to talk, but also others are. Oh, what do you think, <laughs> Well, I'm very grateful because I can see that uh, how heroic you are, uh, you're tired. Why now? Uh, it's one of the reasons is that as with technological development, uh, the quantity of superfluous population is growing. And capitalism will have finally to think out some sort of solution to this and to say how many are we able to save and who. Because as it stands now, from a strictly economic calculation point of view, especially as these people calculate, it's not my calculation, only yours, but yeah, as the mainstream is calculating on the basis of classical economics and so on and so forth, means that about half of the world's white population can be gainfully employed, and maybe some of the other half can be kept alive, and some countries too can fend for themselves, but as to such places as Africa and all this, they will have to fend for, for, for themselves, Let's bury them, and that's it. It's just cutting the losses. It's a result of the com combined development characterized by this technological upheaval and by neoliberalism itself that has left very poor instruments in the hands of any kind of statecraft. Just, it's not there any longer. It's not simply there's less social assistance than it used to be, there are less pensions, less hospitals, less schools, etc. <coughs> also, 
the technologies, the mindset, the idea of democratic planning, all that you know, superstructure of the welfare state is gone. So that's one of the reasons why now it has become acute. And of course, of that, the immigration is a part of this. Okay, how uh, fascist, no fascism, uh, post fascism as opposed to classic fascism can reproduce itself? You know, I don't know really, but one thing seems to be said, it has become much more proteic. You know, it's, it's going, well, for example, look at France now. The moderate right, okay, how to handle their fork and knife, and they can have the proper codes from Bruce Betty. Uh, François Fillon. Well, François Fillon is much more reactionary than Marine Le Pen. Much worse in, in terms of policies. He might not at home talk with his daddy about how to exterminate Jews, but, uh, but you know, it might not be his favorite dinner time topic, <laughs> as it probably has been the case in the Le Pen family. <laughs> but, uh, but you see, but you see, what he proposes to do with the French working class and with the immigrants in general, it's hair-raising. And he's congratulated by the great and by the good. Yeah. So, so this is how they can survive. They will transmogrify them to this and that. At the moment, now in Hungary, everybody knows about the Jobbik party that has been reported on as having paramilitary groups and this and that. And so. For the moment, Again, Mr. Vona, uh, who is the uh, leader of that party, probably will have private conversations I wouldn't care to listen to, because I would be uh, nauseous. But that at this moment he's more moderate than Mr. Orban, certainly, in most respects. Well, he has been forced by the opposition situation in which he finds himself. He has, of course, to, to defend democracy, because otherwise he'll be drowned by Mr. Orban, who is not choosy when it comes to adversaries. He can uh, kick as well the far-right enemy as the left enemy. He's not choosy. Enemy it should be. And, <coughs> and you know, so, you know, that's how, that's how. So no, no real organization. That's quite true. The fascist organizations, as organizations, <coughs> didn't prove uh, very longly that unlike social democracy, unlike some Christian parties, not like the communists, Echo, Umberto Echo. Uh, uh, well, it's a very seductive theory and it's very well written and it's, it, it makes one think, I think differently. And uh, because what he says basically is that elements of fascism are also elements of our culture. It's a very seductive, yeah. yes, it's a very seductive thought and there's a lot of empirical and intuitive truth in it. You know, in, in, towards the end of her life, Anna Arendt had similar uh, intuitions and so on and so forth. Uh, and I don't use the term like this. And uh, uh, <coughs> although, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to reject some of his uh, instances which are really and what you asked about the fear of the masses, of the European masses, and that brings us to the neglected main topic of this discussion today, uh, that's very true. That it is very rare, if not unprecedented in history, to tell successfully uh, people living very hard lives that they should live even harder lives in order to help others. But that's, yes, that is true, that is psychologically and socially and economically very uh, implausible. The question is, is it a good question? Is it a good question? Well, first, is it a good question morally? If indeed you are a Kantian Christian, and I emphasize both, then of course you must do everything in your power to improve the uh, uh, situation of the suffering. In that uh, 
And if that is true, then it has to be true, and then it has to be preached to everybody, popular or not. But is it so or not? That's, that's the question. Uh, and that has to be linked to the, uh, our assessment of the wealth available today for advanced societies for themselves and for those they can reach. And that wealth is very badly distributed. One, of the, one category of the victims are the white poor of the European countries that are abominably treated. Okay. That's because of the refugees, we won't forget the predicament of white proletarians and white agrarians and unemployed and old people in the abandoned villages of Eastern Europe and of Siberia who are living in most extraordinarily bad, terrible lives. And no reason to forget them, and we shouldn't. They are our brothers and sisters, right? And that wealth that should be used to help them, some of it could be used, not all, perhaps it's not enough, but it should be used also to help the immigrants. And that should be negotiated. There should be a discussion, a free discussion with the equals, how to use the available resources to help as many people as possible. And that situation in which you can discuss this freely and equally is not a situation called capitalism. I, 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 I'm sorry, but I, it, it, it cannot be done by structural restraints. Not because all capitalists are evil. Not necessarily, but anyway, it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It's the system is that won't allow such a discussion. But, you know, and, and I must say that there are still enough people in the world worried morally uh, enough to urge such a discussion, such a debate. They won't have it. But the fact that they are pushing is very promising. So, you know, that's utopian, you know, that, that, that's one of my old terms, utopian reformism. You know, in a way, trusting the present society to be able to solve those problems, that's utopian. Or, also, it's moderate, also it's reformist, also it stands to reason, also it's totally hopeless. Um, so I think that, you know, if you want really to be commonplace, and even if you want a bit Machiavellian as you propose, the only thing is to have this total revolution. <laughs> and then I think it's just uh, about time for us to close, so with that very nice thought, please take that to your next conversations and or to here later today. <laughs> and thank you very much to everyone thank there you. and here. to sign the, the attendance sheet that's been going around. It's important for, uh, for 